Hello, good morning. Um, I decided to do my talk in English. I'm sorry, I apologize about that in advance. I realize it might have actually been more useful for you to do it in German. Two uh, things I have to say before I start. I'm going to talk a lot about digital magazines. By that, I don't mean iPad magazines. I actually think that about 97% of magazine apps are terrible and should be burnt with fire. I mean, I'm talking about magazines on the open web. The other thing I have to warn you is I'm not a designer, as Jeremy said, so you're going to see some pretty bad Photoshop in this presentation. Right. So um, I grew up in print magazines. I do, but lately I've been working a lot more in digital, and I'm really interested in what it means to be a magazine on the web. And as such, I've been really interested in an article that was published a week ago, which is very useful for this talk. It was called, um, it was titled, Unless Your Site is About One Thing, It's About Everything. And it was written by a guy called Frederick de Boer, de Boer, de Boer I don't know how to pronounce his name, it's in the US. And this article really made its rounds on what we call media Twitter. So like the media scene really paid attention to this. And what uh, this guy argued was that um, he said, he can basically see no difference between the All, Fusion, Vice Magazine, New York Magazine, the New York Times Magazine, the New Republic, the Atlantic. He said they're all the same. And the reason he said they're all the same is because as a publication on the internet especially that depends on attention and clicks in a sense, there, uh, you can't afford to ever say no to an article. So he basically said that these magazines, these publications, can't, can't really have a, a sensibility. Um, the point of my talk today is to say that he's wrong, <laughs> but it's also, in a sense, to convince you to prove him wrong. Because this is, in a sense, like this is a self fulfilling prophecy. If we believe that, then it's true. But I don't think we need to believe that. I actually think we can say, no, there is a point, there, there is a space for ses sensibility on the web. So I'm going to say he's wrong, but I want to first talk about where he's right, because I think there, is, there are lots of problems with digital media. Um, and in order to do so, I'm going to show you two examples. The first one is really more for entertainment purposes, because I thought it was really funny. That also happened a week ago. It shows you when I prepared this talk. Um, this was a tweet, this was last Friday, and it was a tweet um, about, well, basically what happened was a, a mirror fell off a wall at a restaurant in Lower Manhattan. No one was hurt. This woman tweeted about it. She broke the story by tweeting about it. Within 45 minutes, which is when I uh, took those screenshots, she was contacted by seven different media representatives who were pestering her for the rights to that, to that photo. And just going, when she didn't reply, they just said, like, oh, you, you know, we're going to use the photo anyway, we'll credit you. And this isn't, I mean, I think like, this isn't really terrible, you know? It's not like this is the end of the world. It's local media, obviously, they want to report on local stuff. This is an example of how reporting works these days. But I, when I saw that, I couldn't help but feel, it's like, how many stories about a mirror that fell off a wall do we need? Couldn't that time and energy have been spent a little bit more productively, maybe? Rhetorical question. Um, the second example is a bit more serious, and it was really something that also um, so sort of partly informed this talk. And that was the reporting on the attacks at, on French magazine Charlie Hebdo in uh, January. When the attacks happened, within the first 24 hours, there were 3.4 million tweets with the Je suis Charlie hashtag. And I felt it was like about the same number of articles published during that time about that attack. Um, after those 24 hours, suddenly we had all these different hashtags. Suddenly it's like different voices started appearing. Then it was, it was first Je suis pas Charlie, then it was Je suis Ahmed, Je suis... I, had, I generally had the feeling, 
I was so overwhelmed. I felt it was like a herd of lemmings that had basically, instead of all running in one direction, suddenly broken up and they were all running in different directions and all falling off different cliffs. And I had to get off the internet. It doesn't happen very often, but I, feel, I felt like, okay, I have to sort of step away. And um, of course, this wasn't all media. I mean, this was a conversa that was conversation that was happening on the internet. Those were normal people who were talking about it. But I feel that a lot of that confusion and that and that and the, the like, the jumping to conclusions, um, the the irresponsible, not just reporting, but the irresponsible voicing of opinion, in a sense, was very much driven by media at that time, because everybody felt they had to say something. And I think that is a problem with digital media, right? That it's, it's sort of become a victim of its own success. That it's so cheap to publish something that the default response, the default attitude is, when in doubt, publish. The, the consequence of that is that saying something is mistaken for adding value. And uh, participating in the conversation is often confused with uh, contributing to it. And I sometimes feel that it's like, it's as if all digital media had somewhat, without any sense of humor, made um, the Bavarian comedian Karl Valentin their sort of their prophet. And this is the, the, the motto they all work by. The, Solu the solution, a one solution, it's probably not the only solution, but one solution I see to this problem is to take, and, that's, and this is in both in a conceptual sense and in a day-to-day -day routine sense, right? Uh, I think we should take what we know of magazine making and apply it to the internet, apply it to digital publishing. The first one, the first emoji, by the way, is supposed to be a magazine. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed. I have that a lot. There is no magazine emoji, which I think is pretty preposterous. I always have to default. I always have to use the book. But you understand. You get the point. So magazine thinking on the web. Um, what I mean by that is really, I think you can be broken down to, there's like four pillars to my theory. The first pillar is really the one the, the, the overarching one, the really important one, the one that informs all the others. And that pillar is value. And this seems really obvious now, but in the day-to-day -day reality of digital media, it's not. It's really not. You're under so much pressure to publish that, as I said, like the default attitude is just, let's just publish, right? You don't really think that the value often takes a back seat. What I mean by value is uh, quality, obviously, enduring quality, in a sense, like a certain timelessness and quality. Um, I mean reflection, I mean responsibility, and I mean slowness. And slowness in digital media is obviously very, very um, relative. I mean, slowness in print can be, you publish quarterly, Slowness in digital on the web means you wait a day to publish something. But that day is really important. Like to take that day, or two days maybe, before you publish something, think about something, that might be the step you need to create that value. So I think we really need to think about what it is we want to publish and why we want to publish it. So we need to take a step back and think about what can be our unique take on this? Do we love this? Are we proud of this? What is, it, what, what is this adding to the conversation? And I think the most important thing is, for me, as a, like, as a measure of quality in a magazine editorial sense, is will we still want to read this in one month's time? Because I think if you think of yourself as a magazine on the web, that is really important. So I recently worked, um, well, last autumn I spent some time in New York working with uh, Matter magazine at Medium. And that was really, really good school for, for that kind of thinking. Because what I learned there from the, the editor-in-chief who is um, who's very quite ruthless in his, in his magazine thinking applied to the web, is that you can decide 
not to publish something. You can spend a week working on a piece. You can give it like two rounds of edits, have the journalists, the writers, and you can even do the art already and have it all done and then just go, nah, you know what? I don't really love it. Let's just kill it. So, you know, we, we do that. Like, <laughs> at Matter, they do that. In digital media, that doesn't really happen so very, very often. So, as an example, Matter's approach to the, or Matter's response to the Charlie Hebdo shootings was to publish a, a special on satire, like a debate on satire written by different people from all over the world, from, you know, California to Iraq about what they mean, what satire means and, what, and why it's important and what it can and what it can't do. This was a week after the attacks. Obviously, Matter, I didn't have anything to do with this. I wasn't involved in this particular project, but I know that Matter would have loved to publish something earlier than that. You know, a week is not ideal. But it was a lot better to do this a week later than to just publish a, I don't know, any kind of take on it as so many others did on the day or the day after. But you know, if we talk about value, I think for me there was one piece, I feel like if there are like three articles you read or three things you read about the Charlie Hebdo shootings, this has to be one of them. And this was Tejo Cole writing in The New Yorker. And this was published two days, I think it was two days, two days after the shooting, which seems like nothing. But at the time, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you followed this as closely as I did, but like, at, Two days in Charlie Hebdo time was like two weeks in normal human time, you know? It was like, there was, there was such a rush to do stuff that this already felt like it was really late afterwards. But this was great. This, this is the thing, is like, we can still read this in three years' time and still find it valuable. So, of course, not every web publication can be The New Yorker, you know? Not everyone can get Tejo Cole to write an essay, a magnificent essay, within two days. That's not possible. But I do think that every publication can think about what it is they can add that creates value. And for every publication, that's going to be different. And if you feel that there's nothing you can add, then maybe you should just shut up, you know? So this, these are the numbers, like the most clicked articles in German media for January 2015. And as you'll see, see my great Photoshop skills, all the wonky crosses, um, those are 10 out of the top 13 pieces were from news sites about the Charlie Hebdo attacks. But the second most clicked, most read article had absolutely nothing to do with it. And that was a piece by a young woman who is now a photographer who used to be a model, talking about what it was like to be a model. And this piece was published in Zeit Magazine. And Zeit Magazine didn't publish anything about Charlie Hebdo, as far as I know. I, couldn't, I just couldn't find anything. I didn't see anything at the time. And that's because they, I assume they felt they had nothing valuable to add. But they did add something very valuable for their readers at the time, which was this. And we're still going to read this. I can still read this article again years from now. It's still going to be great. So, that was it, value, M point number one. My second, the second pillar in my grand theory of magazine thinking on the web is community. And I think, I mean, you all know, I mean, everybody, anybody here who grew up with magazines, you all know that magazines are great, are great community builders. But, on the internet, the, the debate around community has really been dominated lately by broken comment culture and by publications shutting down um, their comment function because they felt they couldn't, you know, they can't manage the conversation there um, adequately. But I do think that there are some examples that show that once you inject a sense of identity, community, and purpose into publication, the debate and the interaction becomes really supportive and, and constructive as well. So I think one example, the best example in my opinion, the, the, the publication that owns community, the magazine that owns community on the web is Rookie Magazine. Rookie Magazine is a magazine for teenage girls 
um, founded by one teenage girl, but edited by adults, by professional, uh, by, by very professional adult editors. Um, and still this magazine feels like it's actually made by teenage girls for teenage girls. It has like, it, it, there's a roundness, a completeness to it that comes from a complete two-way conversation at all times that's really, that's just really good. It, just, it feels amazing. It feels like the kind of community that you want to be part of. You know, I'm about 10 years, 15 years too old for this, and I want to be part of it. I wish that it existed when I grew up. So I think Rookie has managed to do this by taking its readers seriously, by creating things that are of value to them, and by giving them ownership over the brand. You, all have, you always have the feeling at Rookie, and this is, you know, through all their, on the website, like on the actual site, but also in all their social media channels, you have the feeling that Rookie is a magazine that is its readers. It's not its editors. The magazine is the readers. As you can see here, for example, they have all these meetups all over the world all the time. Um, another example of an interesting experiment with communities, sort of like the other end of the spectrum, is Kraut Reporter. This is a new um, German web magazine, crowdfunded, modeled on a very similar Dutch um, publication. And what they do is that you, uh, you know, for I think 60 euros a year, you acquire membership, and as a member, you are, you don't, you get access to debate functions. So you're able to talk to other people on the, on the platform, but also to the journalists. So the idea is that you sort of follow a certain thread, or you follow an author, you follow an investigation, and you're in constant exchange with the person making that, whether that's a photographer or a, or a writer. And the people and, the, and members don't just comment, but they actually actively participate in investigations. So I think one of their um, sort of flagship groups is, the, is called Raketen AG. It's like the rocket consortium. And they all investigate rocket science together. Which sounds to me is like, what? <laughs> But they love it, and, it's, and it works. Like, in that particular case, it works. It's like, it's, I think it remains to be seen like, to where, where that can go. But that's a really interesting model. And it's a model that is, looked, that is being looked at right now as a business model as well by much bigger media brands. So, you know, I mean, The Guardian's thinking about doing, uh, having membership, paid membership as a, as a you know, supporting business model. So I think the question, when it comes to community is that we have to ask ourselves is, are we engaging with our audience? But not like, do we have someone there, you know, managing the Facebook account? Are we really engaging with that audience? That's the that's magazine thinking. Mm. The third pillar of my theory is voice. Uh, voice is obviously something very, it's, that is an, inter an, like, an integral part of branding. Um, and voice is important for readers. I think it's very important for community, but it's also super important for business models these days. Because if you want, you know, if you work on a, on, on, uh, on a display advertising model, obviously that favors reach. If you want to go into native advertising, reach is still quite important, but depth becomes a lot more important. Brand becomes a lot more important. And I don't think anybody knows that better than Vice magazine, right? They basically, well, they own native advertising, it seems, on the internet. And Vice magazine is one of the magazines that Frederick de Boer, the guy who wrote that article saying there is no sensibility, is one of, that he says is basically the same as everyone else. He can't, he can't distinguish it. And I think he's really wrong there. Because while Vice does cover everything, whether, it, whether they talk about <laughs> British politics, uh, investigative journalism, or swinger clubs, it's always a very distinctive Vice voice. And you know, like, as a reader, you recognize that voice after some time. They know that voice. 
The other magazine that does that really well is um, New York Magazine, another magazine that Frederick Dubois mentioned as indistinguishable. And I don't think New York Magazine really creates value all the time. I think, they, I think New York Magazine is, you know, it's, they, they, they aggregate, they're pretty bad, you know, they're a content mass producer. Um, but whatever it is they talk about, whether they talk about Obamacare or red carpet fashion or, you know, celebrity Twitter arguments, it's always a New York Magazine voice that you recognize. And I think the question here, when it comes to magazine thinking, is to ask, does this fit what we stand for? Do you know, if you make, if you make a publication, the first thing you need to answer the question, you need to know what you stand for. Lots don't. Now, last point. <laughs> Finally, we get to design. I feel a bit bad. I'm going to lift this as the last point, but I don't think it's not important. Um, it is the fourth pillar. It is design is not just about, you know, obviously it's about making um, publications attractive, but it's also and, and readable, very important. But it's also um, very important for branding, so to to give identity, and it's very important for community and such. So the design really supports everything that comes before. And um, I think the question, I mean, there are lots of questions with design. For me, very often when it comes to magazine thinking, the question we need to ask ourselves is, can we maybe look a bit different from everybody else? Though I feel that these days, that question very often means, can we just not look so much like medium? So, you know, if you say, like, you create a new magazine on the web, you feel like you want to look a bit different, you could look like the activists, or you could maybe look a bit more like Bloomberg Business Week. I think they do a really good job of looking different. You could look a bit more like Lucky Peach. You're going to hear from more later today, I think. Or you're going to, you could look a bit more like the Green Soccer Journal, which I think is a, has a really unusual and great web presence. I also wish, I think, I feel like I want to have a break now and just have that guy stare at you, Sir Geoff Hurst, stare down at you for a while because we get some magnificent photo. Well, anyway, we can't. To come to my conclusion, I think the internet is a really great place. I think the internet is a place where people debate, they argue, they insult each other, they celebrate, they create, they profess love, and they mindlessly click on stuff. We all do. We all mindlessly click on stuff. But that doesn't mean that people who make digital media or digital magazines should work, should adopt an attitude basically of, you know, like junk food producers and say, oh, you know, like people want it, people are going to eat it. We're we are not here to educate them. We're just going to give them what they want. I think we need to take responsibility for what we publish and how we publish it. I think that magazines, especially in print, magazines define themselves by what they don't do. And I think we need to have the guts on the internet as well, when we create web magazines, to say no to things. If it is, we have to define what it is we do and make the decision to not do certain things. So let's create value. Let's build community. Let's develop diverse voices and identities. And let's make it all look delicious. So what I want, what I hope that you might take away from this is that we we all go and we try to prove Frederick de Boer wrong, and we show that even if you're a publication on the web, you can have a sensibility. Thank you. That's it.